if you notice, most of the perfume brands on the market are not perfumers brand. If you go to a fashion brand, the head of the fashion is a fashion designer usually. <laughs> it sounds obvious. Mm -hmm. When you go to a music brand, usually you know in there they have some music composers and there's a singer somewhere and a guitarist and a, a drum player, right? So it's kind of obvious. If you go to Saint Laurent, there is no one in there that is a perfume composer. If you go to Burberry, there is no perfume composer. If you go to Mugler, there is no perfume composer. If you go to BBW, there is zero perfume composer. So it is just merchandising. Eh? So you are Yves Saint Laurent, you just want to launch a pen that says Yves Saint Laurent. So you go to a cheap pen manufacturer, you say, okay, make me quite a pen. And then the pen is going to be dressed up with an Yves Saint Laurent fabric, but it has nothing to do with the ability of writing, which is just generic from somewhere. So this is what is happening with the, the, the perfumes. Uh, what does New York smell like to you? What does it smell like? I, I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not sure. It, it smells, I don't know. Nobody's ever asked me that before. You know? I know, but it could smell like something. It should smell it like. It smells like success. It smells like success. Okay, here comes Christophe. Hey, how okay. are you, Christophe? Welcome. Very good, very good. Yes. <laughs> nice voila. to meet you, Christophe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you for being with us. You know, yeah. you want to go this way? I can go this yeah, way. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. We're the one of those podcasts that is you look at, you know, you like you use your senses the way you do. So master okay. you want people okay. to see and listen. And actually, before you jumped on, I'm in Los Angeles. Jesse's in New York. Where are you today? New York. New York. Oh, yeah. oh you should be together. Yeah. I asked I asked Jesse, what does New York smell like? Because he hasn't been there for a while, you know, post pandemic. But uh, uh, answer that question. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you can. Yeah. <laughs> New York. You know, people always talk about the bad smell, but in fact, just like in a city, there are a few places like that. But in fact, New York has a lot of wonderful smell, including the smell of nature. Mm. Because I want to remind people that it's a very uh, green city, and you have a lot of trees and huge parks, huge huge parks, and the sea, and which is very unique. So, uh, well. So, Christoph, like when you walk through a space, which is your strongest sense? Is your strongest sense your eyes or your ears or your your nose? I think it's the the eyes and the nose for me. Yeah. Now. I want to mention to people because sometimes they feel embarrassed depending on what they smell or what the place smells like, but I'm not a difficult perfumer. So I do notice, I usually know where the things are coming from or why something smells like that or what does it mean about either the person or the place. Eh? Or sometimes it makes me notice things that people don't notice because they always go by their eyes or the music, but then I'm cool about it. Eh? So people should not feel embarrassed. Voila. There are two kinds of perfumers. Some they get really obnoxious I find right. uh, they would make you feel embarrassed or they ask you to rewash this or things it's like some famous uh, say like some perfumers they would ask the student to rewash the laundry because it's too much fabric softener so there's right. this thing in the industry or the perfumer's wife not allowed to wash the bed sheets this way or that way and uh, or to have the entire kitchen scent free no me I love scent and then sometimes it's not, if it's not very nice well you know that's okay uh, I tell the person and then but i'm totally cool and voila so it's just interesting when you go together with a bunch of other perfumers high-end perfumers what do you guys talk about or ladies talk about ah, so we talk about what <laughs> that's actually interesting so two things we talk about the things that came out on the market and we check with each other so did you see this is that just me or do you see anything interesting, Christophe, in there? Because really they talk about all that in the press and usually we always agree. Huh? Whether you're in a business meeting or you're in an informal meeting, if you have 10 perfumers in a room, people should know that we all agree about the description of a scent. We all say, no, me, I didn't see that, me neither. Or we say, oh, did you see it smells a bit of like this nutty effect? Or, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, now you'll say, I say. And at the end, we all agree about the description. The, the act of smelling is very objective. The same as the act of watching. So yes, you can argue about the shades of a color, but usually we agree that commonly we see the same thing. And then the story is, you like it, you don't like it, uh, or it evokes some souvenirs in you or not. 
So that's where you have the discussion, but people should be aware that the act of smelling is actually much more objective than you think. You just have to be a bit trained and be alert. And so we talk about that because we, we know the backstage of perfumery and we, we know what to check also when we hear a certain marketing talk. And then we also talk about, apart from uh, anything else, you know, sports and clubbing and, and whatever. <laughs> and then, yeah. We're just people. Eh? People also forget we are not, well, I don't know, some maybe are arrogant, there's, there's this, this uh, say, but we also like totally people. And also, we also like to share new things we've discovered, a new wine or a new place to eat or a new place in the forest to smell a certain thing or in Central Park. So this we share, like people would say, oh, go, it's a fabulous landscape, it's just beautiful. And we would say, oh, go, and you have to smell that right now because it's like there. So we have one more dimension in our landscape. Well, when did it start for you, this passion? You know, was it as a little kid and where did you grow up or what was it? Was it family, something? What what made you perfect your nose? Uh, so, yeah, I didn't have any much idea about perfumery at all. So me, it was co- total coincidence. Huh? It's when I won the, the chemistry championship in France and I was bronze medal in uh, international. I was vice champion of chemistry uh, uh, synthesis in laboratory. Uh, yeah. And then I went into chemistry and my last internship in chemistry was in flavor chemistry. And I was actually at Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati working on flavors, flavor chemistry and bitterness of toothpaste and Vicks cough syrups and, and uh, scope, you know. But there I saw you had actually flavorists, they're like the perfumers of the, the mouth, if you wish. They are flavorists actually doing the cherry flavor of Vicks all day long and doing the, the mint flavor of Crest all day long. And I mean, it's like a whole recipe, and just that. And then I thought that was fascinating. And uh, I went and interviewed with the perfumers and they took me in their perfumery school at Procter & Gamble. But the thing is, after the fact, what I noticed that at home we are we were very much smell oriented because of food. Everything had to be cool, uh, top, top, top quality. We were a very modest family, half very French and half very Italian, but French, French still, but with Italian background, and very much into food because of these two cultures. Like really, really. So we had to save on technology. We had to save on a lot of things like that. We would not go skiing and everything, but what we had on the plate had to be the best cheese, the best berries, the best sauce from the forest. We were doing foraging a lot, a lot, a lot before it was cool. Wait, excuse me, where did you grow up though, specifically? Uh, so I grew up uh, in France and in New Caledonia. So in France, in the middle of France, where the volcanoes are, Massif Central is very wild. And Volvic water, you know Volvic water, the volcano on the bottom? Mm-hmm. So that's exactly where I grew up. And we would picnic in that volcano here. I grew up also in four years in um, New Caledonia. So it's in the middle of the Pacific, uh, off of Australia. This also I realized when I came to New York in perfumery after that I knew a lot of even exotic smells that people here were not familiar with. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, it's cool. No. It's just cool, but it's like a poet. You don't have to know a lot of words, huh? but if you know a lot of words, you do much more. But that's how I would put it. You know, um, uh, when I see a painting, I, you know, I just like the painting or I don't like the painting, and then I can give it words, right? I can say, well, what this is technically why I like it. With smell, how do you... How, do, how does it work exactly the same way or how does it how does your mind work when you first smell something or smell a perfume same i really want to be and i train all my students that way i even mention that in meetings with clients because people think of the game of first analyzing the perfume like a machine like you would come with the graphic designer eyes and start no first you like to see exactly what you describe you like to be the normal person and you just want to have an impression and more. And of course, because you're trained, you hatch on certain things or not. But, uh, but you still have this, this genuine, I say childish, but it's the adult child, but genuine impression. And then you analyze and say, why is it, what is it that I like specifically, or what is it that I don't like? And then you can analyze better because if you're trained in painting or whatever. And it's the same for me, it's exactly the same in perfumery. I really, I always tell my students, when you take, they're like with the blotters, you know, and then they start analyzing, oh, do you have a little bit of No, it's not the game. You take the blotter, imagine you're somewhere, you think of nothing, you take it, and what's your impression? Is that fresh or not? No, it's not fresh. So go back and make it fresh. We don't start analyzing. Uh, and it's the same. I really, I love me smelling things and I love to have just this impression and see. And then if you're trained, 
you are not fooled as fast or you appreciate quality uh, better, just like uh, in music or just like in cooking or just like in painting. Eh? If you are educated, you appreciate certain things better. And then also you find out why. You say, okay, this is actually what's disturbing me, but actually it's not so bad. Or, uh, voila. So this is, I think it's exactly the same. The one thing that's not the same, that's the cool thing, is that the sense of smell is directly linked to the center of emotion and memory in the brain without any filter. In two steps, you're clack, clack, you're in the emotion and memory. And then your consciousness jumps in and makes you react or not. It's not a drug. You don't fall asleep with lavender like with Valium, no. But then you still decide if you like to be transported or not, or if you decide to yell because you hate that smell, that's still your decision. And so it's not uh, an organic decision, as they say. So that shows you're naive and not educated if you just react like that to a smell. But the first one or two seconds, if you watch something, it goes first to the rational filter of the brain, and then it goes to the emotion and memory center. So uh, this is the only sense, the sense of smell that goes first to emotion. So the first one or two seconds are just very unique. So I have a question though, if it's objective, we just talked about our sense of smell as objective. So at first it goes there and then it goes there. So we, Jesse and I might smell the same thing and I'll have a terrible reaction because it might kick off, does it kick off a memory that oh my God, that was the boyfriend that dumped me or whatever. Correct. So we could have a, a bad reaction to a smell. But I, I want to hear about- you, It returns you back to a place you were once long, long ago or a person you knew once long ago. Yeah, how does, yeah. So yeah, how does- totally, like for many, many years, and it's the longest memory we have and the most precise memory. And so it's true. So here, that's what I was saying. This is the subjective part or your uh, background part. Eh? But it's not because of the smell, it's because of you. So the perfumer or someone educated will say, oh yeah, me, I hate that, but I know what I hate. And I know this is a fabulous lavender, but don't come to me with lavender because I really hate lavender, but I know it's just personal. And so you are not going to shoot the lavender for this new soap project, let's say, you see? Because you know it's you personally and you're not going to make, but when you have the marketing director going on and on and on and on and on about this lavender, that's still, it's a real story actually with the lavender. Oh, it smells of wet dog, it smells of wet dog. And I knew this lavender doesn't smell of wet dog. And, <laughs> and many, many people. And so then a question, then you have to be very soft. Then a story comes up that her dog was dying. The dog was full of abscesses, stinky abscesses. And she was rubbing the dog with lavender. Oh. So in fact, then you see, you unlearn, you relearn, you can still decide to hate lavender. That's totally, I respect that totally. But I like people to disjoint between their personal reaction, and maybe she will never have lavender in her home, that's totally fine, from the reaction with the other people. And this is the consciousness to have, and this is wonderful. And so people can still have their emotions, but then they react differently. It happens a lot with pregnant women or so, uh, because they... They have very strong emotions and a very strong sense of smell. Uh, pregnant women, you you have a super 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 nose. I don't, we don't know the biology, but when women are pregnant and like three months after, this they are super smeller. Like it's it's terrible for them and for the perfumers. <laughs> <laughs> now some brand comes to you, they want to do a new perfume, and they just say, well, you know, we want to do a perfume. We don't have a name for it yet, but we want a new product. How do you start? with that do you do you start in an empty room do you start with one smell do you what you know what how, how do you begin the process of something new so uh bon, this is more this is every perfumer has his or her own uh, approach so me i need to create i need to be inspired and so either i'm inspired by the project or i'm inspired or i make my own story eh? which usually i check with the client or i check after afterwards with the client. Now, will the client start with you with nothing and just say, we want something new? And, and It depends. Uh, well, the largest client, usually they come with their whole story. And, you know, usually the story is uh, for large, large corporations. The brands, the story is she's independent, she's strong, but she needs someone by your side. And then she's between 24 and 28. And uh, she listens to uh, blah, blah, blah. And so they have stories like that. Or... Uh, this one is about the vacation and the escape and, and blah, 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 blah. so they will have some generic stories like that. Yeah. And uh, the smaller brands, 
uh, have much more specific stories, whether they are a place or an emotion or a historical thing, or there are very few, but a few clients, they would come and say, well, I don't know, just show me something. And usually they still say, well, you know me, I like fresh or I like dark. So they don't have the vocabulary that people have in music or in right. other things. The other thing that I need to mention, because in fact, that's the truth for many, many projects, and especially the large projects, either the brand or the perfumer is going to start from an existing perfume. So this is when they say, I am inspired by, it means they actually start. You should know that in perfumery, and this is people have to know that, in perfumery, plagiarism is rewarded because it means you're going to surf on the success of someone else. So you write a song very, very similar Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a judge. You don't have to be a perfumer to know that it smells very similar to the same. And if you would compare the formula, you would see also uh, by the products used. And so there is no copyright law enacted for perfumery. So Uh people copy left and right. Right. Can you just analyze the perfume and know exactly what's in it? Yeah, it's very easy. Uh, In fact, there are entire departments in every fragrance houses where they have one, two, three full-time person and the whole machinery. The machinery came up in the 60s, was very, very well developed already by the 80s, and then in the 90s, full blast. Any fragrance, and especially any successful fragrance, is analyzed, and the perfumer, you have just push a button on my computer, and I have the formula showing up. Or now, which is also new, before it was only within corporations that you had this very specific department. So the brand new thing of the past five years is that now you have independent laboratories at universities or Mm -hmm. uh, just private, and you just send any sample, you pay them, and they give you an analysis that belongs to you, which you can actually publish. And I have started publishing. It's called GCs, gas chromatography. That's uh, Mm -hmm. GCMS is the technique. But I have started to publish analysis of perfumes because it is not uh, confidential. Number one, before it was confidential because it was done only inside the perfume house, which is a private company. So that private analysis is not publishable by the employees. But now you have independent laboratories that have the database needed and the machine needed to do that. So now those analyses are becoming public, which is a big, big revolution, I have to tell you, because now the public is going to know not only what's inside the fragrance, but is going to know that this is done in plain daylight. It's mm-hmm. been going on for forever and it's always been avoided. It's always been, you know, the answer in a way, another way, or they say it's an inspiration. But if I'm inspired by a song by Rihanna and the new song comes out is exactly the same beat, you are sued and you and you lose. And in yeah. fact, you would be the paria of your profession. You'll be like, so the largest brand, we can go on and on. Uh, they do that daily, daily, daily. And so it's a, it's a disease and I'm fighting this disease and I'm uh, sure. <laughs> So just to finish on this theme, to start, when you start really new, imagine that you start a new painting and there are people that are going to start by the middle and they go to the side. Some people, they start with the side, they go in the middle. Some people, they do the whole thing. Then they do another layer, another layer. Some people start from the front. Some people start from the back. The painting, the building is the same. And it's the same in perfumery. You can start with the brick or the wood, and then you build the building around it, or you, you do the whole building of brick, or you, you start with the roof of the building because that's what inspired you. And then you say, how, how am I going to get this roof to hold? And it's the same in perfumery. We say, we start with the top. Now, how am I going to hold that top so that it's long lasting on skin or it diffuses in the end a candle? It's exactly the same approaches as any other art and any other inspiration and any, except plagiarism is rewarded. And we are much more uh, visceral with people because of the one or two seconds. eh? So they won't react to a painting unless it's really gore, maybe, the way they react to a fragrance, but that's just fascinating. You know, what's the difference between like a Tom Ford fragrance or a Burberry fragrance when you're starting? So uh, usually the Burberrys are much more, much, much much more commercial and Tom Ford has chosen uh, because of these two brands. You would have taken Burberry and Yves Saint Laurent where we are like, oh, I don't know the difference. But they're going to say the Yves Saint Laurent is much more luxury and the Burberry is much more active. But when you smell the fragrances, you 
It used to be that way when you have opium and, uh, and Burberry has always been very, very commercial. But like Tom Ford specifically, he likes to have more defined scents. Now in this large collection, there are quite a few scents that people have noticed are inspired. And you know what I mean when we say inspired in perfumery, are inspired by uh, common fragrances. And then he has a few that are really iconic because two reasons. One, he follows very much the development of every fragrance, so it's really there. Usually celebrities are not there only at the end. They say, oh yeah, I like it, and then it's not. They are not, it's merchandising for them. It's not their soul. And for Tom Ford, that's his soul. So he's there very much in a meeting, very much. And the concepts are very defined because they know they want an amber, they know they want a peach, they know they want a cherry or tobacco. Eh? So that targets the consumer more than saying, uh, we have to target everybody in the world and it's just a dynamic guy and he's sexy, but he needs a woman with him and la 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 la, he needs to be cuddled or he's just the, 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 the hairy guy. We, we hear all this kind of tacky thing. You don't develop a music that way, but so, you develop so perfumes. When you're, but when you're, those two are really interesting. You said commercial with Burberry. When you're brainstorming, are they throwing out adjectives? Are they throwing out audience? You know, are they saying we just like you just said we just want to reach everyone and and it smells like a man and a a man's man or like does the language then hook into then you go and and then you go and you show up with smells that could kind of connect with the words they're giving you how does that composition go work a little more about the process so the when it's a large brand like that they brief only very large corporations. And all these large corporations have uh, databases. So it starts with the perfumer having an idea of what could be something masculine. Yeah, they do have words. And huh? they have, let's say, it's called this famous brief that I really hate because it makes it very automatic and very like, there's only one way to brief perfumers and perfumers have to have a certain language because they are not like anybody else. They only expect certain style of words, and, which is very crappy. This is like, a, you don't brief like that a musician if you need a music for a movie, but they will have, yes, a age bracket and then they will have the story and then they will have the color of the juice there is also the price. I did a big post on Instagram uh, in the case of L'Oréal, who has actually some famous brands, but how it goes, the pricing is very, very, very low. And I'm not complaining as a perfumer, but it would be the equivalent of food. It would be literally fast food perfumery because some very common ingredients are totally out of the price range they give you. And they are the same price range for exactly 21 years because I've been 21 years in, in fine fragrances. So that tells you that it's a very merchandising style eh? for those, a lot of these big brands. Bon, voilà. So you, you get that. And then as a perfumer, it's both you want to win the project. So you know, most brands or all brands, including Chanel, they test. So you know, you are going to be a part, be tested in a shopping mall versus the market leader. So the, the leader of the project will ask or will uh, tell you what the market leader reference, the benchmark is going to be. So if the benchmark is fierce by Abercrombie, because that was a big benchmark for a long time, then or Acquadigio, or if the benchmark is now maybe La Vie est Belle by Lancôme, then you're going to get a few La Vie est Belle in, your, in the submissions from the perfumer where they put a bit more rose, a bit more patchouli or whatever. And then uh, some perfumers will say, well, it seems they want a big floral, vanilla floral. And so um, they are going to use their inspiration. And some perfumers come with an accord that have been working on a vanilla orchid for the longest time just by themselves. And then they submit that. And then they might put the vanilla orchid inside a typical vanilla floor on the market. Some brands are also very well known uh, to always tell you voilà, what, what other success they're after. And so you know they're going to launch something similar to this. We forget to talk about that because this is a big bulk. And when they say we hold 70% of the market, all these big brands, in fact, yes, but 50% are copies, copies, copies. And that's why the duty free smells or what it smells like. We, we have to be clear with this. And then some brands have the, like in New York, I mean, in America, BBW is now some of the largest projects for the United States are the fragrances launched at uh, Bath and Body Works. So mm. there, there is a very, even more commercial aspect, or they go via very defined uh, concepts. You, you know the brand names they have. I mean, the, the, right, the, but, the, but those like, but the Bath and Body Works, I go in, in those places and I have an allergic reaction. It just feels, smells toxic to me and I get itchy. Right. Like, 
it's vulgar. Me, I call that vulgar. So it's not that yeah. you're allergic for the reason that I am, but it's correct. It's a style of perfumery. It's like, have you been to Japan? If you go to the pharmacy in Japan, they have like thousands of colors, all these products in pink and yellow. It's like, yeah. it's like you are, you are dressed physically yeah. or like visually. And so, but you know, that's what it is. And so, uh, yeah, it feels vulgar. It feels uh, you're invaded. It feels, it's a certain style. And so once in a while, they have something in there that I call kitsch, you know, nice kitsch. We all like a kitsch music song or, or a kitsch painting in a, in a room. And so some of the kitsch is cool and nice or just pleasant or no brainer. And then some, when it's an overload or when it's cheesy, then we don't like. And same, we can debate what is cheesy, what is kitsch. It's the same, uh, the same level. But it's exactly that. But the, I want to mention that because they are part of the, the largest, largest project in America. So people have to know what it is that commercial perfumery, what it is. What it How is. important is the bottle and the packaging? I think it's very important since a lot of the fragrance smell in the same families, you have to be noticed by something. Plus, if you notice, most of the perfume brands on the market are not perfumers' brands. If you go to a fashion brand, the head of the fashion is a fashion designer, usually. <laughs> it sounds obvious. Mm -hmm. When you go to a music brand, usually, you know, in there, they have some music composers and there's a singer somewhere and a guitarist and a, a drum player, right? So it's kind of obvious. If you go to Saint Laurent, there is no one in there that is a, a perfume composer. If you go to Burberry, there is no perfume composer. If you go to Mugler, there is no perfume composer. If you go to BBW, there is zero perfume composer. So it is just merchandising. Eh? So you are Yves Saint Laurent, you just want to launch a pen that says Yves Saint Laurent. So you go to a cheap pen manufacturer, you say, okay, make me quite a pen. And then the pen is going to be dressed up with an Yves Saint Laurent fabric, but it has nothing to do with the ability of writing, which is just generic from somewhere. So this is what is happening with the, the, the perfumes. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, when the fragrances are designed, all the large corporations that, that host the perfumers, so they, you would say the architecture bureaus, the perfume bureaus that host the perfumers, they all have very big databases about the emotion triggered by every single ingredient around mm -hmm. the world. So they test it. Patchouli, lavender, cardamom, floral ozone, hedion, isoid super. These are notes you don't know, but they're molecular notes. Bagdanol, javanol. They have, and they've tested that among 300 French persons, 300 German persons, 300 American persons, 300 Chinese persons, 300 oh. South, uh, Indian wow. from uh, person. Yes. And so the perfumers are going also to use some of that. And you have the same in design. I suspect IKEA might use what is a cool shape maybe i don't know but you would see you can do a poem that way too you could say okay i'm writing a story that everybody around the world will like and so we have the data about this kind of movie where you know uh, he yeah. loves her uh, she doesn't love him but she loves him and that about so you could have the same so that's also part of the design stuff man. and now they put the ai on top which is just database crunching so far and so that also goes into the soup Huh? But what was the question originally? Well, just just the is, is there an elegance to the bottle? Is there a uh, yeah, the is there something that it means? Is there a good bottle, a bad bottle? You know. Ah, uh, so bon, me, I'm an olfactory guy. I'm not a visual guy, and I do appreciate certain bottles. I always tell people make sure it's convenient to spray <laughs> because believe it or not, some bottles it's impossible to spray. Either they're too big, too clunky. I always say, please, they have to be easy to spray and they cannot fall in the bathroom or on a table. You know, some balls are so tall, you go like this and it's terrible. Yeah. So, but otherwise, I think people are quite inventive with bottles. Me, I don't have any comments, but how do they do it? They go to a real bottle designer that they pay a real creative fee to design a real piece of product design. Right? So it's a real thing, but because they are visual people, all these brands are mostly fashion music brands when we say celebrities is most of them it's uh, music sports both sport but they go via a licensor and then fashion brands so they're all a lot visual 
or they are visual people on their team. And so they know how to do something cool visually. And because the juice in there is very generic, there is no juice that smell like hip hop. The hip hop stars, they have boring juices that smell like Adidas shower gel. I'm sorry to say. Yeah? <laughs> and yeah, and you're like, yeah, but it's not you. Or Madonna, yeah. her fragrance smells like the grandmother of Madonna because she doesn't know olfaction and she thought it was cool to have the nurturing feeling of her grandmother. And then it's a flop because it smelled old. And Madonna is not about the grandmother. I was yeah. like, sorry. <laughs> but the ball is cool. They, they, they are very inventive with balls. But with juices, the, the celebrities, they sign contracts that they would never sign for their own music or their own fashion. They don't know that it's going to be filtered. They never sign with the perfumers directly, uh, by the way. They sign with filters with L'Oréal. L'Oréal is a shampoo company. And then L'Oréal is going to go and find a cheap juice from perfumers at the perfumers bureaus, but are not led by perfumers either. So it's reorganized in a merchandising company or like, do you remember when you had staff musicians, you know, you would pay a little yeah. bit and people would write the song quickly for you. Sure. Well, that's the story. Yeah. Yeah. We have okay. to change I, that. Now I have a question, longevity of a scent. Okay. It's staying on. Is that a whole market thing too, where the manufacturer the brand, not the man, is like, okay, make sure it wears off every two hours so that they'll keep spraying and they'll buy more. Like, how do you think when you as a, you know, as the, as the kind of the artist here, how long should a scent stay, you know, with you? How often do you, like, I spray too much, I'm sure. Like, I when I find a scent I like, Le Labo, by the way, French, I like that brand. How long should it stay on? The little thing, for the spray, me, I spray quite a bit. Huh? Me, I'm like, and I think the nose loves to smell. And huh? you don't use your nose by smelling, just like you don't use your eyes by just watching, watching colors. Huh? Just, so just the nose is made to smell. And the quantities are so small that it doesn't hurt your lung. It would be much, 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 much too strong from your nose before you even start just scratching your lung a little bit. Because it's totally different order of magnitude in terms of what, what we can smell is tiny, tiny, tiny. So number one, so you can smell or spray a, a lot. Yeah. Then the long lastingness. So number one, it's true that you could have a scent that you love very much. Me, for instance, Olibanum, frankincense water. Frankincense is not long lasting, but I love frankincense, just the extract. It doesn't smell like the church when it's just the pure oil. Huh? Anyway, I think it's just good mood or orange or citrus. And sometimes I don't want the scent to last, so I know I spray a lot. Like, you know, like you spray avian water mist for your skin yeah. a little bit, but, yeah. but then after one minute, it's just dry because the water yeah. evaporates. So here for me, it's just to have a freshness like that at the gym or whatever. Bon. Or the rhubarb, I made the rhubarb, is exactly the thing, except that rhubarb lasts. But you have to know that after maybe an hour or 30 minutes, it dies and then you have to respray. So if you want to respray all the time, then fine. I mean, you use, a, let's say, water if you wish. Now, you have to know, though, that making a fragrance that is long-lasting is a big know-how and is a big challenge. So surprisingly, when the people say, but you know, that's a fragrance you have to respray, you're like, is that really by design? Or is it because actually the perfumer did not know how to make it long-lasting, but if it would be long-lasting, everybody would like it better. Well, so this you have to know. And for me, it's true. It's very exceptional that I find a fragrance that doesn't last, that is a good quality fragrance. And I tell a trick for everybody. Notice between, so that's my own say, but that's what I've noticed. I've studied a lot of fragrances. And also I know what it takes to make a long-lasting fragrance. Between hour two and hour three, you will see that a lot of fragrances, they collapse. It's very easy to make a fragrance that lasts between one or two hours on skin or your clothing, but especially the skin. The skin is the hardest, huh? So spray on your clothing, it will last longer. But you will see a lot of fragrances after between hour two and three, they collapse or they smell like a boring, you're back to the men's aftershave. Why? Because they put those typical long lasting notes, but we know them well. And so now it's meant or they disappear. And so it's a big know-how and that know-how is not a one style recipe. That's also the big problem. It's not like saying just put some bass in the music. Certain times, certain bass we know they disappear or they make a ball and the fragrance is like this and you don't smell anything. You know, the fragrance it sticks out like a sore thumb. Yes, you can put patchouli, but you know that patchouli brings a certain character. So of course, when something smells really strong patchouli, you're like, is that the concept? Or is it because the person did not know how to make it long lasting or to make it strong? So you put a lot of patchouli, but then it's, uh, voila. So once you know all this, then you know how to appreciate the things, voila. I see. You talk about music a lot. I, I think we learned that maybe, did you work on a scent with Beyonce? 
So, yes, yeah, so at the time, and I think still now is okay. So Beyonce, I've never met her. Yes, I created a sense for her and I knew it would be for her, but she never comes to the meeting. Uh, at one point in the middle of the, of the project, they show her what the two contenders are that they have selected, but it's not even a team. It's not a, man a, a mother. I think a mother is a manager. So it's not even that team. Huh? So between Beyonce and me, uh, there's about, uh, I don't know, five or six layers. And between the consumer and the perfumer, there are about seven layers I calculated. So she signs with a packager, what I call a packager or a wrapper. So she would sign at the time she had signed with uh, Tommy Hilfiger with uh, Estee Lauder. In Saint Laurent, they signed with L'Oréal. And so then the, it's L'Oréal that decides. But so here was, so then, and then on Estee Lauder, you have the French department, the marketing department, and then the celebrity relation department. And so I remember at the middle of the project, they showed her the two contenders that they had selected. And she said, oh, good, good, I like, I like. And then at the end, they showed her the one that won that was mine. And I've never made a mod because Beyonce said, oh, can I have that story? Or can I have this story? No, the story actually did not come from Beyonce at all. So a lot of fragrances, the story, they don't really come from them. It's not even their, their marketing team. It's not the music marketing team. It's the packaging marketing team and the consumer merchandising team that decides that vanilla gourmand caramel, maybe you've noticed the caramel notes in the past uh, 20 years, or this type of floral or whatever, sells very well. And so we're going to go in there, et cetera, et cetera. But from your perspective, okay, yes, it sounds like there's so many layers and it's a big machine. But from your perspective, when you're creating, are you thinking of something essentially about her? Like, how do you, what, what her music means to you, how she makes you feel? Like, how do you approach it from an artistic perspective? Well, it's funny you say that. My very, very, very first project when I write in fan fragrances, one of my first was for FUBU, when FUBU wanted to launch a fragrance. And I went with my, well, I don't know music so much, but yes, with my, the music style and DJ style and everything. And I can tell you my fragrance went nowhere. So it was noticed because it was quite creative and I had all the whole thing about uh, turning tables and mixing and the same I, I arranged for the fragrance to mix uh, similarly. It went nowhere because it was much too creative and it was not, uh, boom. And so we would love to say that, but at the end, the machine comes like this. And many times, in fact, many times, the perfume was originally not created for the celebrity for whom it's made. Well, well I guess at times it happens. You write a song for Michael Jackson and then Usher sings it. That could, that could happen, I guess. But still, you know what style of the song it is. It's not yeah. like a song for uh, an opera and then at the end it's uh, Chris Brown singing it, singing it. You know what I mean? It's, uh, no. uh, it was a nice project. Huh? So it had to be feminine. And I remember we had a little bit of the, the gold pollen because it was Beyonce gold. I do recall in my mind a certain story and I try to make it fit, but then it, it gets purified a lot when it's for the big projects like that. But me, yes, I do have to create in my mind the story. Huh? And sometimes it doesn't match the story they give me because I'm not inspired and that's fine. But I need to have strong elements. I need to see if it's going to be super dynamic, if it was something really cozy or something energizing or uh, and then a story about them or something I know or something I know from New York or from a certain landscape somewhere or a certain plant you know do you um when you get a bottle of perfume and you don't know who made it and you smell it do you know who the perfumer was no only one only one I can tell because she has a very very strong she had a very very strong signature that's Sofia Grossman she's very well known for this because she had a certain way of adjusting certain things and she was doing a lot of a similar structure a bit like Philip Stark you know when you see Philip Stark there's something very similar all the time or Jeff Koons you would say there's something similar for some kind of Jeff Koons voilà so a few artists but I would say otherwise no me I cannot tell is there a note, is there a note smell as your favorite scent that you always turn to? Ah, uh, no, that I always turn to, no, no, no. I see in the notes like colors, but instead of some colors that you have, and instead then you have three primary colors and then you have a bit more colors to do all the shades. The piano has 88 keys. My piano has 13 to 1400 keys. I don't know if you understand. Ingredients, single ingredients, huh? And they change and they, blah, blah, blah. But no, me, I'm not, uh, I'm never inspired by one ingredient and I do a first about one ingredient. Some perfumers, they function that way. So it's a different style. Eh? So it would be like an architect is inspired by brick 
and does the whole building out of brick. And no, me, I would be inspired by something, a cause or a story or well, something. And then I would be like, okay, I'm going to use actually a lot of brick to do this, but I'm, I don't start with the ingredients. But some perfumers, they would start with patchouli or patchouli flour or or well, whatever. No, I like a lot of things because I'm a camino. I love to create for a lot of different things. Some in commercial, I don't do commercial, uh, very rare, very, very rare. But I, I do commercial in ambient scenting a lot, but these are much, much more, more freedom. Yeah, I, I should mention that. In fine perfumery, people mention, think it's only for the skin. Well, the world of fine perfumery is changing because now ambient scenting, which you know smell like the bathroom, huh? now is changing because there are a few devices that respect refined ingredients like ginger, bergamot, and the stores and hotels. And now at home, the devices are uh, very good. And they are well, one of the rare fine fragrance perfumer creating 50% of my time for ambient sensing, but to create something really nice, like a sculpture. I call them air sculptures. And I do a lot of that. And that's going to grow more and more. And so there you have much more uh, leeway. There are less filters. You're much closer to the decision makers. And also you're considered like the artist, like a sculpture or an interior designer. And so they respect much more. It's more, it's a real team. Because before the perfumer, it's politically correct that they say they're part of the Usher team or the Ariana Grande team or I mean, no. It's not I go and a perfumer in a room and they try and da 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 and then comes out something. No, that's not what happens. But ambient scenting and niche perfumery, this is happening more and more. Wow. Christophe, this has been yeah. incredible. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Really, Jesse, he is very, he's so interested in perfumery, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. for other reasons than I am, but it's a wonderful, um, in yeah, Thank you so much. so much. There's so much to Thank explore. you. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank Run you so much. Run the street. <laughs> yeah. Fabulous. Yeah, I'll come to the store. You see, I'm in my store here. Oh, uh, beautiful. Store, New York. Yeah, yeah see? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, that's a song here you. to to experience the scent here that I refurbished. Yeah. Um, beautiful. What part of the West Village, you know, uh, Elephant and Castle, uh, Jonathan Adler, Rosemary in the West Village, Greenwich Avenue. I'm right here. Okay. We'll find you. By the Village Vanguard. Thank you, Christophe. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Anytime. Bye. 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 Bye.